What's up, Real Life family? We are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with you today. We are excited because we know that all it takes is one encounter with God to change your whole life. And we believe that that day could be today. We would love it if you would share this experience. Click the share button or copy the link and send it to a friend. Also, be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you stay connected to your Real Life family. Well, it's about time to get started. Thanks again for joining us. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all moms at all our locations. We love you and uh, truly wouldn't be here without you. So we just love you and honor you today. We're thankful for you. And uh, we actually, we're going to talk about freedom from religion. And uh, the Lord had me switch it up this week. I was thinking about it and I really feel like this message is so important. And a lot of it has to do with parenting, family of origin issues. But we want to talk today in this Free Me series about, and this is our prayer today, Lord, free me from insecurity. Free me from approval, me looking for affirmation and acceptance and applause. And Lord, free me to a life that is rooted and flowing from your love for me. Because here's the difference, all right? We're either living a life looking for love, or we're living a life that's freed to live from love. Those are the differences. In 1 John, it tells us that we love him, we love God, because why? Because he first loved us, right? So there's already love there for us, and when we find that and when we believe that, it changes our life. And now we're living from the love of the Father. We're not looking for the love, approval, and acceptance of everybody else. Which, by the way, is our trend, and it starts at a very young age. Wouldn't you agree? When we're babies, we are born with this instinctual need to please other people. And we generally, like, we coo and we do things, and then somebody usually tells us, you're so cute. Look at you. Look at you, you're just so cute. Oh my gosh. And it doesn't matter what you do when you're a baby, but if you do something, but if if as a kid I do something and it makes you smile, I want to do it again. And what's what, the younger we are, the less it takes to make people smile. Have you noticed that? When you're a baby, all you have to do is just be there. If you toot as a baby, they're like, oh my gosh, it's so cute. Try that at my age. <laughs> you get asked to leave. Anyway, I'm just saying. So we grow up. <laughs> Wasn't in my notes. Um, you grow up with this instinctual desire to get approval, affirmation, and applause from other people. And then it goes from your parents to your teachers, to your bosses, and then your coworkers, and your friends, and your colleagues, and, and, uh, and, and then even as you get older, your children, you're looking for their approval and affirmation that you did some things right, maybe. The theme song for humanity, I am convinced, God had it be written in the 70s because that's when all the greatest music was written, actually. It's factual. That's why we revise it every generation. Just throwing that out there. And if you're part of this generation, that's great, too. Your music came from their music. Uh, So it's my parents' generation. They created the best music. And so it makes sense that the theme song for humanity came out in 1977. That's when it was written. It was released in 79, 80 here in the States, but it was by a band called Cheap Trick. Do you remember these people? I want you to want me. I don't want to make it like flashback for some of you. You're in the disco right now. And the hair is flowing. I need you to need me. I'd love you to love me. Oh, wait, that was from Pastor Mark. Yeah. I'm begging you to beg me. I had to sing. It was important because Pastor Mark will get up here, and he was an international singing sensation. But when you sing, it's always worship. When I sing, it's classic rock. So what, I don't know what that's all about. Anyway, I Want You to Want Me is the theme song for humans. Like This is the actual truth about who and how we are. And I don't care how you were raised, what generation, you might as well face it. You're addicted to love. That's also a song, right? But we grow up, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. 
Somebody's stuck in the 70s. All right. But there's a huge like turn right here in Romans 5, 8. But that's how we're all raised. That's what we all know is looking for and living for love. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see the difference? The gospel is the difference that where most of us are living and looking for love, God demonstrated, he proved, he showed his love for us in this, that while we, we had not done anything to be accepted, he accepted us. Before we were lovable, he loved us. And he demonstrates his love that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Where the world says you can be loved if God says you're loved already. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I loved you before you were born. I knit you together in your mother's womb, and I prove it, my love for you, by sending my son to die on the cross for you. That's the gospel, and that's the tension is we're either living for love or we're living from the love that we know the Father already has for us, and it's a game changer. Romans 12, uh, verse 2, it says that we're not supposed to conform any longer to the pattern of this world but we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And when we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, we understand uh, we're able to approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God is describing this tension for us that exists in all of our lives, where the Lord wants to free us by the renewing of our mind. He transforms us, and so we know his love. We know that he's crazy about us, and it causes us to live differently. He says, but the world is always yelling. Have you noticed that, by the way? And it seems like in every generation, they get louder. Loud and proud voices yelling all the time, be like us, do what we say, conform to our standard, say our words, don't say the words we tell you you can't say, just toe the line. You can conform to the standard of the world and be like everybody else. God says, no, if you're gonna be free, you're gonna have to be transformed. And being transformed starts by refusing to be any longer conformed to the pattern of the world, which this has always been the battle. God's people in the Old Testament, what would happen? He would give them new lands and they would go into those lands. And then through the peer pressure, the social pressure, the conforming to the standard of the world, they would become like the people around them. And they'd start worshiping their gods and living by their rules. And God would have to send prophets to come and warn them like, hey, come out of them, like be separate from them. Quit mixing and being like them. That's like the whole history of the Old Testament. And we do the same thing today. And and we fall into these social norms and patterns that people are telling us. So we have to stop living for the acceptance and love and approval of the world and of others. And we, we are invited to start living from the love that the Father has already shown us. The world says, I love you if... And God says, you're loved already, period, end of story. You, you've always been loved. You'll always be loved. And you don't have to live for it. You can live from it. It really changes things. It, and this is the battle for so many people. This is the tension that we live with. And what we see is most people, if they haven't accepted the love of the Father that's available to us only in and through Christ Jesus, right? Through what he did for us on the cross, that's how he proved this love. We come to him through that. If we don't accept that and we're not living from that, we are looking for that. And it will change the trajectory of our life. I was at an open mic night recently, um, kicking it with some musician friends. And we're just hanging out, having a good time. And one of, one of the young people that, that frequents this open mic night is actually pretty talented and a good guy, really humble. And so I was talking to him and just... Hey, you know, you're, you're really talented. Oh man. You know, and just there, there's, there's a humility that seemed like it was rooted maybe more in the insecurity that a lot of us have. So we're talking and I said, do you have any original music? And he's like, mm, uh, I mean, I do. Yeah. I said, well, I never hear you play it. I've heard you at the open mic nights. We always play covers, you know, and like other people's music, but I've never heard any of your original stuff. He goes, yeah, I don't, I don't really play it in public. I just, it's just, I'm like, well, why not? You're writing music. You write music. It's a gift to other people. I said, well, have you ever recorded it? Just get it down because maybe you could put some songs out there. And he's like, no, just, and so I I keep poking, you know, it's what pastors do. It's why you don't hang out with us offline. You just come and listen and leave. But I keep poking a little bit and I'm poking. I'm just like, I'm curious. Like, why is that, that you have this gift? And he said, well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There there's for me, 
I just hear voices. And I was like, go on. Fascinated by this conversation and the fact that he's only 25 and he's aware that there are voices in his head because they are in all of our heads. We're not all aware. And he said, well, the one I see the most is my dad. And he just always told me I'd never amount to anything. He said, so the truth is, Every time I sit down to, every time an opportunity opens up in my life or I get to create or I hear that voice that it's no good and I'll never amount to anything. And then I hear my mom telling me I'm going to be just like my dad who left when I was young and I only saw him a few times. But when I did, he told me the family curse was on me and, and I'm like, dang, I was like, bro, that's heavy. He said, yeah, I know. I know. That's my life. I'm like, but it doesn't have to be like, there's another dad. And his voice is saying, I love you. I've always loved you. You don't have to earn it. And, and, and so I just started sharing the gospel with him in this simple way. I said, you, there's a different dad. Your heavenly father is crazy about you. And he has plans and purposes for your life. And he starts, like, we're friends now. We've been texting. We're making progress. I know. And you know how hard it is for a pastor to make a friend in a bar? <laughs> you got to really be on. This dude is listening. And the last time we hung out, I saw the hope in his eyes. He start. maybe there is a dad and he's not disappointed in me. Maybe there's a dad and he's rooting for me. He's actually already given his life for me because he has plans for me. We're either living from the love of the father or we're sure looking for it. And we got other voices. I want to read this to you with, with that setup. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter two. Sorry, I, I'm learning to flip pages with one hand because I'm using the handheld now. Have you guys noticed this? It's because the other one kept going out and we're like, let's just use the one that works every time, even though it gets stuck in your beard. So that's where we're at currently. But it does sound good, right? It does sound good. And we haven't had a problem since we started using it. So thank you, Pastor Daniel. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the team there. And all I have to do is learn to change pages with one hand. Ephesians chapter two, verse four. I have a few other things Robin and I are working on. Anyway, we'll get into those later. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, this is not the dad most people are talking about. This is not the, the picture of God that most people have. This God has great love for us. He's rich in mercy. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that, or so that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the what? gift of God, not by work so that no one could boast for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul goes over the top out of his way to overemphasize that we cannot and do not do anything to win the approval, acceptance, or love of God. Did you catch that as we were going through that? He's like, you can't. actually, the only reason we have it is because of, and he lists his kindness, his love, his mercy, his grace, his gifts that he gives us. Those are the words he uses us to describe God's disposition towards us. Even if we wanted to win or try to get God to approve or like us more, we really couldn't because it's not by works so that nobody can boast. Nobody in the kingdom gets to raise their hand and go, well, I'm here because <laughs> nobody in the kingdom gets to hold their trophy up in front of the church and go, well, I'm accepted because the judges got together and gave me a perfect 10. The elders decided that I was, there's none of that. We're in the kingdom in spite of not because of thank you, Lord. The only because of is because of his great love, because of his mercy, because of his kindness. It's not anything we've done. It's just who he is is. And so where the world says you can be loved, if God says, no, you're already loved and you don't, I don't want you working for my love that that creates sick and unhealthy patterns. I want you working from my love. You don't have to earn it. You already have it. You just have to accept it. That's the thing. It's so Ephesians two ten. This is cool too. I, I just read it, but he says, for we're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. So he actually has plans and purposes for us to do amazing things, but we're not saved and accepted by those things. We are, we are saved and accepted for those things. We go and do them because we have his love. Um, and I, I love that verse 10. It says we are God's handiwork. Did you see that? It's such a cool, in the Greek, it's the word poema or poema. And uh, it's, it's actually where we get our word poem, but it means a product, something that's been produced. And the, the literal understanding of it is it is a handmade product, not a mass produced. We'll be here between four and 8 p.m. on Amazon created by the People's Republic of China. Anyway, um, that's stuff that we can get just like that. It's, it's not one of those. No, this is a handmade original, right? This is a poema. It's a, in a sense, a poem. It's a work of art. It's handmade. It's personally produced. He says, that's what you are. You're God's personal handiwork, his work of art. It's a nod to the creation narrative in Genesis where we're reminded, oh yeah, we were formed by his own hands from the dust of the ground. We, our being was invigorated with his own breath. That's personal. That's intimate. That's the creation narrative that our God gave us. His life became our life source. We're his handiwork. The way Peter says it in first Peter chapter two, he says, but you're a chosen people. I love that. You're chosen a royal priesthood, royal, a holy nation. Holy means set apart uh, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you'd not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Handiwork, special possession, chosen, accepted, love. This is the theme, by the way. You start reading the New Testament with, through this lens, you're going to see over and over this theme that God wants us to understand who we are, that, that who we are comes from whose we are, that we're his. And that uh, here's, here's the truth that I, I find with most people. I'm either living out of my divine identity or I'm living with deep insecurity. You see this? I'm either rooted in and my life is derived from my divine identity, who I am in Christ, or I'm living with deep insecurity and it's showing. I, I either know that I'm an image bearer. I was created in his image. I've been given, it's his breath in my lungs. Like uh, in him, I am being held together, that I'm intimately connected, that uh, I love him because he first loved me, that he demonstrated his love. I either believe these things and it changes my life or I don't. And the voices then, see, when I start to believe that I, I'm not looking for love because I'm living from his love already, the voices that I've lived for, the approval that I've longed for, when I, when I get my divine identity, those voices get quiet in my life because his voice gets a lot louder. And this is especially important. I don't know if you've noticed, but our world is uh, mildly obsessed with image. And don't judge because you have Instagram. And we, uh, Instagram, Facebook. And for those of you who are just posting cat stuff, you're, you're exempt for a minute. Um, <laughs> there will be a whole other sermon for you. Um, but... <laughs> We love image and we project and we put things out there for other people. And none of us wake up and go, oh my gosh, I look so horrible there. I'm going to put that online. And if we do know that it's time to put something online, we usually now see in my day, we didn't filter. We didn't have, you all have tools and I bless this generation. Thank you so much. Crop, edit, Photoshop, adjust. Like it's such a blessing in my day. If you looked bad in a picture, it's because you looked bad. And if you wanted to look better in a picture, you had to take a better picture. That's just the way it was. Like I'm, people be like, I look terrible there. It just, it's just how you look. I, I don't know what to do with it. Now you're like, I look terrible and I don't want to. So I'm going to fix it. I actually saw online, there was a picture of an Instagram model that had uh, filtered and cropped and worked on the image to make herself look thinner. The only thing she didn't realize is that she was stretching her image in that direction. It was also stretching her hand and she ended up looking like Dr. Octopus from Spider-Man with this long arm. And people were like, what is going on, lizard people?
but you can only stretch the image so far, but it's what we do because we're obsessed with image. Everything is, can I look better? And how do people see me? We're looking for acceptance, approval, applause, and affirmation. And I see, and it starts very young. Wait, these young, young girls are putting things online so that they can hear people. You're so beautiful. You're so gorgeous. Because we want to hear that. First Samuel 16, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Thank you, God. He sees the real thing. I wish we did. You know, it'd be a lot easier for me if people were like God, uh, because then I wouldn't have had this lady come up to me the other day, grab my beard with one hand and forcibly imitate scissors with the other hand. I'm like, that's assault. Okay. I mean, you're laughing, but if I did it to you, you'd hit 911. Like I have a pastor grabbing. Can you imagine if I snatched some lady's hair? I was like, we're cutting this off right now. Whoa, I'd get knocked out. I'm like, I just don't think it's fair. There's rules for you and for me and they're different. But anyway, <laughs> grabs my facial hair, starts, she's like, we got to get rid of this. And then, and Robin's right there. What do you think she's doing? Laughing. <laughs> there are some fights that it takes a woman to, you need as a man, you need a woman to fight for you. My woman's laughing. So I'm just here for it. You know, and she's, this lady's all up in my face and she asks me some questions and she's like, you know, this beard makes you look older, right? And I was like, Okay, sure. Yeah. She said, well, don't you want to look younger? I said, but I'm not younger. Why, why would I want to look younger? I'm not younger and that's okay. I actually am what I am. And, and if this helps me look, actually, my daughter said, I'm so sick of everybody thinking you're my brother. I don't like it when you look young, grow your beard. I'm like, okay. You know, so, but this lady's so mad. She goes, I don't understand why you don't want to look younger. I said, well, I don't understand the obsession with having to look younger. Where does it end? At some point, think about the projection of if I'm obsessed with looking better and younger, do I keep cutting, trimming, dying, nipping, tucking, pulling, plucking, plumping until I run out of money or face? At some point, they can't, they, there's nothing to stretch back anymore, Madonna. Uh, so, girl, just, you're fine. Just be a fine older woman. It's okay. Don't have to look like you're not. We're obsessed. First Peter three, God's trying to free us. I'm telling you first Peter three, chapter three, verse three says your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight, man. Whose approval are we looking for when we have the approval? God is looking at different things. And what if we worked on our inner self half as much as we worked on our outer self? I mean, where would we be? What if we accepted how we're made because we know who made us? We're fearfully and wonderfully and guess what? Imperfectly made as my daughter. She has a little clothing brand, but one of her designs says we're perfectly imperfect. Psalm 139 is this true by design. I am not perfect, but I'm following the one who is perfect. And someday I will be perfected in his image and in his presence. But when we understand our divine identity, we don't have to live with this deep insecurity and men. Can I talk to you for a second? Cause if we did a better job of not always looking after lusting after and celebrating only outward beauty, it might free the ladies in our lives up to pursue the things of God and, and to work on the inner beauty. If we celebrated when we see Christ in our wives, in our girlfriends, in our daughters, in our sisters, you see Christ in them, celebrate it, say it, applaud parents. It's on us too. Like the only thing we usually applaud, especially little girls, what are we, you're so cute. You're so pretty. Your outfit's so nice. Your hair is so cute. And then we wonder why they're image obsessed. The only way they get approval is through their looks. And then they're always posing for the camera and trying to look snappy because that's all we ever give. Let's celebrate divine identity more than our image. Our earthly image doesn't matter, but that divine identity is eternal. When we see Christ in someone applaud, you're so loving. I love that about you. I love your gentle spirit. Wow. You're so joyful instead of you're so pretty. What about you're so patient? You're like, man, I don't think I could say that. You start saying it. Maybe they start realizing that's the thing, right? Call it out. Speak life. 
We're always celebrating outward beauty. I'm just saying, man, if we rewarded and celebrated inward beauty, we'd be encouraging each other towards that thing that God wants for us. But really, in the end, the question all of us have to answer is, whose approval am I living for? What voice am I trying to satisfy? Whose approval am I looking for? If it's anyone other than God, I'm in trouble. In Matthew chapter six, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, uh, at least three times, just in chapter six, he's like, don't do it for people. You're going to be tempted to live your life for the approval of others. And here's the thing. When you get it, that's your whole reward. Somebody said, good job. He said, so do your giving in secret. So your father, your heavenly father will see you in secret. He'll reward you in secret. You don't have to do your spiritual things for the applause of people giving. He talks about fasting. He talks about praying and how we want the attention and the approval of others. He says, no, no, no. When you live for the, for the, uh, approval and for the audience of one, rather than everybody, you're going to feel this love of your father who sees who you really are in Colossians chapter three. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not human masters. People want to rule over you and get you to conform to the standard of this world. He says, get free from that. Trying to get everybody else's approval. Since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you're serving. It's not about putting on a show for people. It's about becoming a servant of God. He sees he keeps score and his scorecard is different. He's grading on a different scale than everybody else's. He doesn't look at what other people look at. And here's the thing in the end, whose approval does it really matter? There's only one judge. There's only one person that's going to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And all the other likes that you have on your profile, all the other people who uh, put clap hands on your picture, it doesn't matter anymore. There's only, and, and let me say this too, because I think some of you feel like, well, I'm, I'm free of that. I don't have insecurity and I don't have approval addiction because I don't care what anybody else says. I want to check you for a second because that's most likely pride, not freedom. And that's a whole other enslavement that you've set yourself up as God. And usually it comes from rejection. We've been hurt enough and we've been, we looked for that love and approval and we didn't get it. So we just decided to set ourselves up as God and said, well, I don't care what you all think. I'm going to create my own standard. I'll create my own morality. I'll live by my own rules and I'll be judged by them. No, you won't. Actually, there is a judge and it's not you. There is a God and it's not you. There is a standard and it's not yours. And in the end, the only approval that matters will be the one who is coming to judge the world, Jesus. And, and this is so important because we bow to Jesus, the savior. Thank you, Lord, for what you did on the cross. But we will soon see Jesus, the king, the judge, the ruler of heaven and earth. We he came in humility last time. He's coming in glory next time. We know this, right? We saw his humanity. We're about to witness his deity and Here's the reaction of humans when they see him. Every knee will bow. You talk about being conformed to a standard. When we see Jesus upon his return, every tongue will confess and agree that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is coming. For some people, it's going to be too late, though. It doesn't have to be you. You can agree with God now. You can accept his love now before it's too late. And I want you to understand God accepts you how you are. Absolutely. But he also loves you way too much to leave you that way. And so the difference, the world is about tolerance. God is about repentance. Huge difference. The world applauds exactly how you are and says, please don't ever change. God says, I love you so much. And I see you're an image bearer of me. And I see what I put in you. I know what I created you for. I see sparks of my son in you and, and I want to fan that flame and I want my spirit to bring that to fruition. And I began a good work and I'll be faithful to carry it through to completion, but it's going to take repentance, not tolerance. It's going to take change. It's going to take effort. He accepts you just the way you are, but he loves you way too much to leave you that way. Tolerance says just celebrate everybody's choices. Uh, just say that it's great and just applaud them for whatever God says. No, there's a standard. There's right and there's and, and I am the standard. There's actual truth in this world and I am the truth. There's only one way and I am that way. And so in his kindness, the Bible says, in his great love for us, in his kindness, he leads us to repentance, to get us to change our mind and agree with him that he's God and that I'm not. 
I just want you to know, you know, that the enemy will affirm you. The enemy will applaud you for all the wrong things. The enemy wants to celebrate your bad choices. And there's a way that seems right to people. God just says in the end, it leads to destruction. And so be careful when the world's applauding you and telling you, you do you, whatever makes you happy. God doesn't call us to a life of happiness. He calls us to holiness because he knows that it will ultimately lead to our eternal happiness. But if we pursue happiness, we'll miss the whole thing altogether. The enemy will applaud you. God loves you. He loves you too much to let you go down the path of personal destruction, which is why he says, repent, turn around, come change direction before it's too late. I love you. And in my kindness towards you, I already sent my son. So you'd repent. So you'd turn around. So you'd change direction while you still can repent, turn around, change direction before uh, you go any further, before the stakes get any higher, come back. His kindness leads us to repentance. I don't know what voice you're listening to today. There's a voice that is inside you that has been calling to you. I'm very sure of this. I designed you. I've delivered you. I died for you. There's, there's other voices, man. The world loud, proud, that a, a roaring lion is how God describes our enemy. He's always yelling and screaming to try to get our attention, to get us out of fear, to do what he says. The world wants us to conform to its standard. They're yelling, be like us, do like us, believe like us, live like us, agree with us. That still soft voice just keeps whispering. I'm crazy about you. I created you. I was crucified for you. I am coming back for you. Be ready. Only one voice that loved you enough to go to the cross for you. Listen to that voice. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. Check the difference. Those voices in your head, ask every one of those voices. Did you love me enough to go to the cross for me? If not, I don't want to hear what you have to say today because God demonstrated his love for me in this, that while I was still a sinner, I didn't have to earn it, work for it, live for it or look for it. He, Christ died for me. He proved his love. And so now I can live from it. I'm free to not be destroyed by insecurity, but my life can be defined through divine identity. I want you to know you're super special. There, there is someone who has been rooting for you since before you were born. And what is in you is of him. And he is not going to let that thing go without a fight. He's fighting for you right now. Listen to that voice. Submit to that voice. Turn from whatever it is that's got you going in that other direction and come back to him. Come back to the father who is crazy about you. I want you to know today. You know, I think we're all plagued by so many insecurities, but you can be free of your insecurity when, when you find your divine identity. It's secure. It's fixed. Today, you don't have to spend the rest of your life looking for and living for love and approval, but you can live from the love that God already has for you. And he proved it in Jesus. Let me pray for us. God, this message is, is uh, really on my heart today, just that I know so many people that you are speaking to right now are living so far beneath the love that you have for them. They're making choices based on lies. Some of them have created lifestyles around the lies that they believed about themselves, things that other people have told them, things that they've chosen to believe, things that they've continued to perpetuate because they're still looking for the love, the approval, the acceptance that's already theirs in Christ. I just think about the, the story you told Jesus. God, you, you portrayed God as our heavenly father who runs to us while we are still a long way off. And it didn't stop there, but you threw your arms around, and kissed us, gave us the robe and the ring and threw that party. And I, I, I know today that's what heaven wants to do. That God, you really want some people to come back and go, I can stop listening to those voices and living for their approval. And I can start living from the love that my father has for me. I pray for that freedom to fall on our church, God. 
It's so important because, Lord, if we don't get free, we can never fulfill our purpose. And the reason you put us here is to not do what the world says, but to say to the world what it is you're trying to say to them. Lord, I thank you that your kindness, your love, it leads us to repentance, to turn, to change, and to find truth and freedom and fulfillment. I'm praying for it today for so many, Lord, that they hear your voice. It's kind. It's gentle. It's loving. It's rooted in mercy. It's a gift. You're so good. Thank you, Father. I pray that hearts would be softened towards you. The enemy has built up lies about you and walls around you that just aren't real. But I thank you, God, that you've demonstrated, you proved your love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That truth can set us free, Lord. Help us to believe it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Real Life Online. We hope this video encouraged you. As a part of our Real Life family, we want you to know that we are here for you. If you need prayer or would like to get connected to any of the resources we mentioned today, you can find it all at real.life slash connect. And if you'd like to stay up to date with what God's doing here at Real Life and always know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find links to our website and other real life resources available for you in the description area below. Thanks so much for spending part of your day with us. We want you to know that God loves you, we love you, and we'll see you next time.